for being here. This is a delight to see so many people here today. I would like to introduce Ann Gass. She is a historian of women's suffrage. Ann. Well, thanks so much, everyone, for coming today. Can you hear me? Oh, should I use this other mic, or is this one on? Both are on. Both are on. OK. Uh, this is a really uh, big day for me. I'm just so excited to be unveiling one of these other suffrage markers. Uh, it's been a, a three-year process to get this done. So as you know, Isabel Greenwood was one of thousands of Mainers, uh, women and, and men, who worked to pass the 19th Amendment, to win voting rights for women. Uh, not all women were enfranchised for the 19th Amendment. Uh, but uh, in Maine, at least, uh, um, the vast majority of them were. But how many, how many of these, these suffrage workers could you name? Uh, maybe apart from Isabel. Uh, I, I uh, couldn't have named any of them, and my great-grandparents were both very active in the suffrage movement. I didn't know anything about their work until I was in my 40s and started doing this research. Uh, and that sort of, uh, that, that process of doing the research and writing my book, uh, Voting Down the Rows, Florence Brooks White House and Maine's Fight for Women's Suffrage, uh, kind of transformed me into a women's rights history activist, which I don't really know if that's a thing, but that's what I call myself. <laughs> and, uh, and I've done a lot to try to promote women's suffrage uh, history um, in Maine and around the country. Um, so we don't celebrate women's history as well as we celebrate men. And, and one example of this is nationally, not more than nine out of 10 public statues are of men. Um, and Gloria Steinem famously said something like, you know, women have always been part of history. We just aren't talked about as part of it. I think I'm paraphrasing her there, but she was acknowledge, acknowledging that women you know, have been right there along with men all along the way, but we just don't celebrate them the way we, we do our men. So the, this marker that we just unveiled is part of the main suffrage centennial trail that is intended to bring some of the suffrage history to life and to make it, you know, part of the centerpiece of our communities. There are a total of, or will be a seven, total of seven markers placed around the state. And the markers, um, uh, really came out of a project created by something called the National Collaborative for Women's History Sites. And uh, in, the, in the lead up to the 2020 centennial, the National Collaborative realized that we were just, we, we had done such a poor job of recognizing and celebrating our suffrage history. And so they created this project called the National Votes for Women Trail. And it was a, a really visionary project that was designed to literally map uh, locations around the country in every state where some kind of suffrage activity took place and, uh, and where you know, a suffrage activist could be commemorated. Um, and now, I just looked the other day, and there are over 2,800 sites uh, now in their database. And, and uh, you can go to their, go, just Google National Votes for Women Trail and get, you'll find the map, and you can go to any state in the country, you can pull it up on your phone. You could be in Farmington and say, hey, I wonder if there was any suffrage activity in Farmington, and pull up um, this marker and, and uh, any other kinds of entries that were, were made there. So that's still a work in progress, but it's, it's a lot better than zero, which is where we were a few years ago. So the first, these markers um, were, were donated to the state and to every state in the country, five markers per state, by the William G. Pomeroy Foundation, which is located uh, in New York, uh, but, um, and it had one of their initiatives was to erect roadside markers, historical markers around New York State, uh, focusing really just on New York State history. But 
uh, they approached the National Women's uh, Votes for Women Trail and wanted to donate these five markers for every state. And so that's where this project really came from. Um, and so in Maine, the, the marker project, I'm the main coordinator for the National Votes for Women Trail, but um, I also sit on the steering committee of something called the Maine Suffrage Centennial Collaborative, which was a kind of a, a, a loose agglomeration of people that came together to, to prepare to commemorate the, uh, the suffrage centennial in 2020. So it was the Maine Suffrage Centennial Collaborative that, that kind of took over this process of, of uh, approving and citing these markers. But we had to work with helpers in every single case, and I just can't say enough thanks to uh, Jane Wodinski and, and her team for getting this done here in, in uh, Farmington for, for Isabel, who so richly deserves to be um, remembered. And, um, you know, I, 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 there are others who are more knowledgeable than I about Isabel, but, um, I mean, she was very, very typical of women who were working on suffrage during her time. She had a family to take care of. Uh, her husband was busy with his businesses, and so she was running the house and, and uh, you know, lots of other things besides, probably. And so even though she served on the board of the Maine Women's Suffrage Association, that was based in Portland. So for her to get to a meeting that, you know, the other members could just stroll down the street to uh, was an all-day affair plus the train fare. So she often couldn't get to those meetings, but she was extremely active up here. And one of the things I've always admired about her is how she would take the suffrage, you know, you know call out to people where they were, including state fairs or county fairs. And I just thought that was so cool that she would have a suffrage booth at, at a county fair. Um, and this marker, of course, that we just unveiled commemorates a, a Maine Women's Suffrage Association annual meeting that, that she uh, was kind of the, the leader of and, and helped set up here in Farmington. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about the other markers and, and just because it ended up being a much bigger process than we had anticipated. The, we, we, you know, or I should say I, <laughs> spent a fair amount of time trying to identify a black suffragist, you know, a Native American suffragist here in Maine, really had a tr lot of trouble doing that. Um, and so the, the first five markers went to white, uh, you know, largely affluent uh, people who are, that's been typical about who the suffrage movement has recognized over the years, but we felt very strongly that that wasn't sufficient. And so what we decided to do was to uh, fundraise separately for two additional markers that aren't identical to this one uh, because we don't own the, the template, but uh, we created a, a new marker template that we hope will uh, be something that people around the state, groups around the state, can use to commem commemorate other suffrage history, other women's history. It doesn't have to be limited to suffrage. We use the blue from the main state seal um, as the the coloring on the marker, and uh, and I think it and and was made. It, otherwise, it looks almost identical. It's made in the same factory and and uh, has the same dimensions. Um, so. Uh, the, the Pomeroy guidelines really didn't allow us to, to choose anything other than the kinds of people we chose for those first five, and, but we weren't limited to that. And so uh, I found three interns, college interns, to help me identify some, um, some black suffragists. We ended up focusing on Bangor because there had been quite a thriving black community there in the early 20th century. And we were able to, uh, this was their job, was to match signatures on the 1917 suffrage petition to, uh, to the census, because that way we could see the race of the signers and, and, um, and their addresses and start learning more about them. And we hooked up with a, a black historian up there, David Payne, and he helped us a lot. And so in the end, there, the, the, so we ended up dedicating the marker to the black matriarchs of Bangor. Because, because of racism, they weren't welcome as leaders in the white suffrage movement, but they were leaders in their own community and did so much to take care of their own community. And so that, that marker really recognizes, uh, it does touch on their suffrage um, interest and, and, and work, but uh, focuses much more uh, as well on, on their other, other community activities. And then the, the seventh 
uh, mark or the, the last of the, the set two separate ones is for uh, Lucy Nicole Arpula, who was a, a citizen of the Penobscot Nation. She was an artist and entertainer, but also a suffrage activist. And so that marker uh, recognizes her work on, um, on voting rights for Native Americans as well as other civil rights and uh, is, is uh, located on Indian Island. Um, we worked really closely with the Penobscot Nation on that. So the, the final, the lineup, uh, in addition to those, those two and, and Isabel's, is um, uh, there's, there's, there are two in Portland, one for my great-grandparents, uh, Robert Treat and Florence Brooks Whitehouse. That's at, at 42 Deering Street in Portland, which was their first home there. And uh, uh, Augusta Hunt is at 165 State Street in Portland. Um, there's Camille Lassard Bissonnette, who has a, a marker in Lewiston on Lisbon Street outside the offices of Le Messanger, which was a French language newspaper. And she was a columnist at, who wrote uh, French language you know, uh, articles and columns about the need for women's voting rights. And so that we're really excited about that one because it departs from the white affluent uh, English speaking woman, the stereotype that has uh, kind of burdened the suffrage movement for a while. And then uh, finally at the State House in Augusta, and I'm really proud of that one because when we first went up there and started talking to people, they advised us, no, you can't have a marker here. And, um, and I went away and thought about that, um, and I thought, you know, would the suffragists have accepted no for an answer? Clearly they didn't. And um, so I just went back and found a way in, and uh, now that marker is in place. We'll, uh, we'll be unveiling that one next Friday, a week from tomorrow, um, which is actually August 26th is Women's Equality Day, which is the day that the 19th Amendment was finally, you know, officially recognized and made part of the Constitution. And so uh, it's a 9 a.m. ceremony that allows Governor Mills to come and speak, and, uh, and Secretary of State Shanna Bellows will be speaking as well, and, and I think a, a representative from the Penobscot Nation and maybe a couple, well, myself, and maybe a couple other people will see. It's still kind of a work in progress, but I'm just really, really proud of that. So these are the, the seven markers of the, um, you know, Isabel Greenwood's marker is one of the seven original ones for the Suffrage Centennial Trail here in Maine, and we hope to see, you know, hundreds and hundreds more of these types of markers for women all over Maine. Thank you very much, Ann. Now I'd like to introduce Michaela Carney, who will tell us a little bit about Isabel. Hello. <laughs> um, before we begin, I want to ask you a few questions. When you think of women's suffrage, what does it mean to you? If women did not gain the right to vote, how would that have helped or hurt historical outcomes? And when you think of young women today, what scares you most about their future? I don't want you to answer these questions right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> they're pretty weighty. But just think about them and the impact the women's suffrage movement has had on society over the last 100 years. After the ratification of the United States Constitution, voting rights were left to the states to determine. As early as the 1830s, women began to ask the question why they had so few rights. It was then when ideas of women's suffrage began to come around. At the 1848 Seneca Falls Convention in New York, women's suffrage was an important topic of conversation and was one of the 18 <coughs> resolutions adopted that weekend. Over the next 72 years, the women's suffrage movement would travel across state lines and into many households, gathering support wherever it went. 
Suffrage is the right to vote in political elections. Women's suffrage is women having the right to vote. In the early 1900s, the most famous suffragists were divided on what women's suffrage meant and what it meant to them. To some, it was all women, no exclusions. To others, it was only wealthy white women. Or to anti-suffragists, it was no women at all. No matter the definition, it was a difficult fight overall, both at the state level and the national level. Notable figures who were on the national stage included, but were not limited to, Lucy Stone, Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Frances Willard, and Alice Paul. These ladies were at the front of the women's suffrage mission. They fought for decades, together, separately, and with countless others to make the voices of women heard. Voices coming from all across the country, from the mountains to the oceans, from farms to cities. They inspired women everywhere to help the fight, including Cordelia A. Quinby, who was the first president of the Maine Women's Suffrage Association, founded in January of 1873. The Women's Suffrage Association, or MWSA, held yearly conventions where leaders would conduct training sessions in public speaking, petition signature gathering, and fundraising. The attendees would also hear guest speakers, sometimes national suffrage leaders, and enjoy time to discuss what each is doing in their own community. In 1906, Isabel Greenwood founded the Franklin County Equal Suffrage Association and became a prominent figure in the Maine's fight for women's suffrage. Sarah Isabel Whittier was born on October 13, 1862, in Chesterville to Phineas and Sarah G. Whittier. Isabel had one older sister, Grace, born in 1859. Isabel and her sister attended school in Chesterville in Wilton, and in 1878, Isabel moved to Farmington, where just six years later, she would marry, gaining the prominent last name of Greenwood. It is unclear as to when Isabel gained an interest in women's suffrage. However, she is in the program of the MWSA's 1905 annual convention as a discussion leader on the topic, why do women need the ballot in the home and in philanthropy? One year later, she would found the Franklin County Equal Suffrage Association and work primarily at gaining support in small communities in Western Maine. Isabel was a force to be reckoned with. She knew her role as a female and as a mother, never once sacrificing one for the other. She was an executive member of the MWSA, where she would attend meetings and host events. While she did not spend all of her time in the Portland area, she did expand voter education and outreach and lead others to do the same in Western Maine communities. The group consistently passed out materials like pamphlets and flyers, highlighting the positive impact that women voters could have on the election outcomes, attempting to stop the spread of misinformation that the anti-suffragist party was circulating. Arguments such as women having emotional instability and intellectual disability were among the top answers as to why women should not vote. Other arguments were a distraction from domestic duties, a threat to the moral order if women join politics, an expensive burden on municipalities, and simply women don't even want to vote. Isabel crushed these anti-suffragist sentiments with every chance she had. She and her team worked tirelessly over a decade in the Franklin County area to gain support for the movement. In 1917, Maine attempted to pass suffrage but failed to do so. However, in 1919, it passed. And rather than end the fight, Isabel continued to fight, but instead educated the new voters in what they should do and registering others. The name of the Franklin County Equal Suffrage Association was promptly changed to the Main League of Women's Voters, where Isabel would be an executive assistant for several years. Throughout the rest of her life, Isabel continued to work toward women's rights until her passing in 1958. Though her work was overshadowed by that of her husband, it is certainly no less important. 
History tells us that women go unnoticed when participating in male-dominated professions such as politics, government, science and engineering, and medicine. Even today, it is difficult to gain recognition for the work women do. We are often talked down to, our wages are less, and promotions are not given as freely. However, the more we discuss the lives of women, such as Isabel Greenwood, the more normal we make a non-traditional lifestyle. The women of her generation paved the way for the women of our mother's generation and now ours. In the state legislature, there are more women in political seats than ever before, and we even have our first female governor. Lastly, when you take the time to reflect on the influential work that Isabel Greenwood and the suffragists did, take a moment to understand how you talk to the people around you, how you support them, encourage them, and promote them. Because at the end of the day, the hard work done in the past means nothing if those values are disappearing today. Thank you. Well, thank you, Michaela. That was, that was very good. And I just wanted to take a moment to introduce some family members of Isabel's who are here. They are Sandy, Kim, Debbie, and Ken. And if you want to ask them questions, we've got a table over here that has information on about Isabel, and they got some good stories. So we have cookies, tea, and punch, and we're so glad you're all here. <laughs>